For better or worse, the home field advantage continues to be about as valuable as it's been all season for Houston. And Carlos Correa reminds Jim Crane he should have bought Dior. It's episode 44 of Stone Cold Strows, and it starts right now. Welcome to Stone Cold Strows. I'm Brandon Strange. I'm joined by senior content contributor Charlie Palillo. Follow him on Twitter at Palillo and read his weekly column on sportsmap.com. Next to him is sportsmap.com editor Josh Jordan. Follow him on Twitter at joshjordan975. Be sure to hit like on this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. The full version of this podcast is available in audio form right now and on your favorite podcast app. Links are in the description. Just a reminder, the three of us host a Texans podcast called Texans on tap on our other YouTube channel, sports map Texans, and also wherever you listen to your podcast, Charlie, it's episode 44, which Astros player who wore the number 44. Are you thinking of this week? You used past tense. So I will follow accordingly. Uh, unless something unfortunate happens with his career arc, Jordan Alvarez will be part of a number 44 retirement ceremony, but that should be a joint number retiring. Justin Verlander throws a wrench into the works because with the two World Series titles and two Cy Youngs, even though he's pitched a much shorter duration than Roy Oswalt pitched with the Astros, Roy Oswalt had the best, when you factor in length of body of work, the best pitching career of any Houston Astro ever. Better than Nolan Ryan, better than Larry Durker, better than Roger Clemens, who was also a compressed window. Roy Oswalt was, well, wizard-like. And also so self-effacing that it took like two years into his career before he politely corrected the media, which had been calling him Roy Oswalt. And a quick (laughs) shout out also to Danny Darwin, who wore 44 for about a half decade here. One of the better nicknames in Astros history, Dr. Death for his mean on the mound. Well, guys, let's get into it. If there's one thing you can count on with Houston, it's that former Astros always seem to be their kryptonite. And outside of Garrett Cole, there's probably no more formidable former Stro to face in the postseason than Carlos Correa. In a team full of postseason vets, Correa's leadership probably doesn't make the difference here on Houston. But how critical of an edge does it give a team like Minnesota? Well, when he hits, a whole lot. Intangibles are only valuable if they are supporting tangibles, as in Astros catching. I know, I know, I'm getting ahead of the script. Uh, Carlos Correa was a bad player this season, right? Collecting his 33 mil in the first year, the six years, 200 million for which he settled after the Giants and Mets pulled the contracts. He flunked the physicals. Correa was a 230 hitter with an OPS of 711. Defensive metrics falling off, ankle problems, plantar fasciitis that had him on the injured list. He didn't even play the last two weeks of the regular season. Well, over the first two games of this series, best Overall player on the field, Jordan with the three home runs, but Correa impact offensively, defensively. I don't know if he processed it to say, uh, yeah, remember, I was a pretty good shortstop too when he made just a spectacular play. And oh, that arm throwing out Jeremy Pena for the last out in game two. Uh, But Correa, you know, he was an Astros version of Mr. October. Tremendous clutch resume. Uh, There were some ups and downs, but the overall ups, right? He vaulted forward in postseason play. Uh, so the leadership and all that is great, but if you're going to hit cleanup, you better hit. And in game two, he knocked the Astros senseless. Yeah, he's got that edge. He knows how these guys approach hitters, what they're trying to do in these scenarios. I mean, think about it. He's the guy that runs to the pitching mound every time. So he was there for all those conversations. Of how do we want to attack this guy? What do we want to do here? He mentioned in the postgame show, he knew you know, when Fromber was pitching against him, there is that last at bat that they were going to pitch the ball down. It'd be a sinker or a changeup. He knew what Maldi was going to be dialing up for him, and, and he made the adjustment there. So that's not going to change. You know, he's going to have intel for pitchers on his team, hitters on his team. But, you know, th- that's OK. The Astros are really good, you know, about talking with each other, what they're seeing from pitchers and making adjustments. So that's something they're going to have to do. But it is a little weird seeing it, you know, with Correa in your own building. But, hey, it's the postseason. The Astros are no strangers to Garrett Cole and George Springer and Carlos Correa and, you know, having to having to face Garrett Cole after him playing on your team. Astros have been through this before. They just, they got to hit the ball better. They got to score some runs. 
So, Josh, you're suggesting that Carlos Correa in that two RBI bet outsmarted the genius catcher? <laughs> hmm. Um, Correa was always a thoughtful and expansive interview on here. And I thought he was just fabulous with his openness and insight in the post game to game two, specifically to that at bat, but also in addressing, I don't think it was really surprising, uh, but fairly lusty booing. Some of it envy of, gee, wish he's still here as he's getting one clutch hit after another during the course of the game. Uh, but it grew into a louder booing than I thought. Uh, as much as anything, in-game envy. And as Correa said, I'm not going to make anything of it. I'm not on their team anymore. They want me to strike out every time. Yeah, I would just point out, nice. <laughs> maybe pitching him inside a little bit more. I would. Hunter Brown struck him out with, with an inside fastball. That's something where you don't want Correa to be able to get extended and, and use his arms to, to really shoot balls the other way. And jamming him seems to work. I would have liked to have seen a little more of that in, in the past game. So, Hopefully that's something they'll do here moving forward. Short series baseball. You just, you don't know. A matchup can be favorable and not work out at all. Uh, but the Astros offense in a nutshell in 2023, the first two games of the series. Right, Altuve jump starts you in game one with the leadoff home run and Jordan does his thing. And then game two, they do nothing basically until the outcome is determined. Alvarez with the two run homer when you're down six, nothing late. So you either show out or the season can end in Minneapolis. The Twins were a 47-34 and 34 home team this year. Uh, fortunately, Major League Baseball assigning the Astros day games. Temperatures will be in the mid-50s, which is cool, but not onerous. I mean, Seattle was about that, the night games the last week of the season. Um, but I would say not optimal uh, for the Astros playing in the mid-50s, but better than if you play at night where the temperatures will be dropping through the 40s. Uh, pitching matchup game three obviously favors Minnesota. Game four is probably no better than a toss-up. So if offered right now, if you're the Astros, yes, I'll take my chances in a rematch against Pablo Lopez, who absolutely dominated them in game two. Well, he would be the Twins game five starter Friday night with Verlander on five days rest, unless the Astros were to get a little panicky if down 2-1 contemplate coming back with Verlander on three days rest, thinking, well, we'd have Fromber for game five. Well, right now, would that be such a good thing to have Fromber in reserve for game five? So should the Astros be down 2-1? I think you hope like mad that Urquidy, France, bullpen game, and the bats can get you through. And then it's JV on home ice in game five. Which is Friday, Friday the 13th, by the way. <laughs> or they just went to Minneapolis. It's not like that's off the table. Uh, and the Astros so much better on the road this year. This would be a good time to send up a reminder flare of that. Well, if games one and two were a microcosm of the offense, then they certainly were of the pitching as well because Verlander didn't have his best stuff on Saturday, but he still gave Dusty a really good outing. Uh, and Hector Neris come in, and a guy who has you know been nails for you for most of the season, uh, he's, but has also kind of walked the razor's edge at times. He almost gave it all back. Uh, we didn't even mention Graveman not making the DS roster due to that bum shoulder. Uh, we've mentioned, you know, from Valdez and, you know, kind of seeing the ugly end of what his season looked like on Sunday. Um, now, you know, you mentioned it, the, the Astros go to the cold Midwest. You've got Javier versus Sonny Gray. Uh, you know, I just, I look at this and I look at, you know, kind of the question marks around who your, you know, your starters, your long relief. And now you've got a question about Naris. Do the Astros have enough pitching to get out of this series? Sure they do, because they only need to win two out of three games. Maybe they win one 11-8, like the Rangers beat the Orioles in game two in that series. Right, we're tantalizingly close to an Astros-Rangers American League Championship Series. Talk about a buzzkill if it's the Rangers who ultimately get there and the Twins uh, take out the Astros. Uh, you know, Sonny Gray pitched twice against the Astros this year. Well, it was very early in the season. But this is a guy who may be top three for American League Cy Young Award. He was third in earned run average in 2.79, at 2.79. First start against the Astros this season, seven innings, one run, 13 strikeouts. He has plus-plus stuff. Second time they saw him, six-plus innings, three runs, but it was one run. He gave up a single and a walk to start the seventh, and then the bullpen gave up a grand slam to Altuve. So Sonny Gray is really good. Uh, you know that crowd is going to be gone crazy. That shouldn't rattle the Astros, but it is a boost to the Twins. Right? If Minnesota plays from in front, uh, that can be a, a real problem. 
Uh, on Hector Naris, I- I'm just going to say that's one of those stuff happens stuff. The entire season, Hector Naris never gave up more than two earned runs in an outing. Once he gave up three runs, one was unearned. And so that he implodes, gives up four runs in, in one inning. Well, at least it happened when they had a 5 nothing lead instead of a 3 nothing lead. Yeah, I kind of expected something like that to happen with Naris after all the shenanigans in Seattle. You know, and then he was so great in the Arizona series. I just figured all that emotion going in that one way, he he would have one performance where he didn't perform as well. So at least it was in a game where, you know, you still came away with the victory. I'm still going to go back to him if I need him. I, I'm just, he's been too good, to, you know, to not trust in those big situations. And with Javier, I mean, even Verlander, as great as he was the other night, he gave you six innings. You know, he, Fromber got knocked out early in this last game. If Javier gives you five, you're going to be happy with that. And just looking back – You know, knock on wood, he hasn't given up more than four since July. So as far as earned runs. So, you know, if if Javier can kind of keep you in the game, only give up a couple runs, give you around five innings, I think you're going to be happy with that. And if you look at his last four starts, he hasn't given up more than three. And he's mostly gone five or six. He went four and two thirds in one of those games. So I think Javier, he's pitching better than we've seen him pitch for a good portion of the season. So if there's ever a time to kind of lean on him, and he's familiar with this back against the wall in Philly in the World Series when you're down and, and you need a big performance. And, he, you know, he throws the combined no hitter. Javier's been in these types of situations before. I think you just you just have to you have to trust him and, and hope for the best. But three runs in five innings, that's not so good. And against Sonny Gray, your bullpen better be perfect and you hope you can eke out four three. Uh, simplest summation for what Javier needs to get done in game three is keep the ball in the ballpark. Uh, he had major gopher ball problems this season. You know, he and Hunter Brown were the two guys who gave up the most. The Twins tying the Rangers, the American League lead in home runs. The Twins have shown their capability to take it deep. Uh, at home, they're going to have their lineup loaded with left-handed hitters. And one thing in the matchup game, you know, that Rocco Baldelli has in his favor, right? he knows the Astros can't go to any lefties in the bullpen. So it's not like he's going to worry about burning up his bench. Whereas in the Fromber start, he knew he could pinch hit once a righty came into the game because it would be only righties after that. The Twins have a good ball club, right? The Astros aren't much better than them overall in this series. We'll see whether they turn out to be better than them at all. Well, that's going to be it for part one of Stone Cold Strows. To listen to the full podcast, it's up right now at your favorite podcast provider. To watch the rest of our conversation on YouTube, check out the Stone Cold Strows playlist. We'll be releasing those videos very shortly. And as always, go Strows. 